comments. I may think that I already said this. So if something doesn't make sense, please stop me and ask. Okay, so I had, I'm going to give you a bit of a non-standard lecture that encompasses a whole bunch of methods that you hopefully learned at this point. Uh, it's really bleeding edge research. The manuscript is not yet accepted. So we're going to talk about the functional basis of microorganism classification. And as it's known in the real world, tell me what you do and I'll tell you who you are. Okay, so we're going to start with this quote from a guy that I hope you guys know. Uh, this is Charles Darwin's quote. He said, I was much struck how entirely vague and arbitrary is the distinction between species and varieties. And what is he talking about? Anybody know? Do you guys remember what Charles Darwin was doing, writing? Why? Yes? No? Maybe? Do you know? Yes. Okay. What, what was this about? What the variation of species. Right. So he was talking about finches, the species of finches, right, that he saw on Galapagos Island. Uh, now we know them as Geospizza magni... Rostris still, but I can never pronounce this. Um, Geospizza magnirostris, Geospizza fortis, Certhidia olivacea, and Geospizza parvula, which has actually now been assigned to a different genus and species, uh, Camarinchus parvulus. Now, uh, how many of you think that Darwin actually named them this way? Anybody? No. So he was more into large ground finch, medium ground finch, small tree finch and the green warbler finch. So hopefully if these guys were colored, you know, this guy would be somehow green, although you never know. And uh, this, I guess, bird lives in the trees. I guess that's how he assigned them. But what is the difference between large and medium is very hard for me to judge. Okay, so it is a little bit on the subjective side of what you do in classification of organisms. It gets a little more complicated when you look at microbes, okay? Um, large dot, a bunch of something looking things. I don't know. Uh, it's, um, it's one of those classifications where it's difficult. So. Why do we classify things? Let's see if we can get a second answer in a row that agrees with me. Why do we classify things? What's your name? Yvonne. Yvonne. It makes things easier. So when you have a classified, you, you can tell something about only this class and you can summarize some. OK, summarize. Anybody else? Can you tell me your name so I? Peter, okay. Facilitates description. Facilitates description. Summarize, facilitate description. Fair. Why do we need this? Well, to make sure that everyone is talking about the same when they make experience on something. Okay, so you, what you're saying is actually my first point. We like to name things, right? We want to say this is a car, okay? We agree that this is a car. Some of us agree that this is the car, all right? <laughs> but, um, all right, so... <laughs> this is not a pipe. <laughs> um, okay, so what I heard is the third thing on my list. Can anyone guess what the second thing is? Why do we classify things? I'm assuming I have the same amount of time. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anybody? Okay. All right. It teaches us about the history of uh, things. So basically, we can actually look at cars and look at their classification, let's say by the engine type, right? From steam engine to gasoline to diesel to hybrid to hydrogen. And we can actually figure out where this particular notion of having that engine came from, right? You can actually argue about what are the, the sources that went into it, but in the end you see the history, the evolution of the engine. And finally, the third thing is what you guys have been talking about, which is probably the most important and the most obvious, 
Yes, how we react to these things in the future, right? So the idea is you can take care of the car, right? So if you've classified cars as cars, you would know that you need to do some maintenance on them in a very particular way. You you know that you need to drive them and you also know that you shouldn't be hit by them, right? And all of this comes from from the notion of, you know, car is a car. We know what a car is, okay? I don't know. It's a picture from the internet, but it does look like Manhattan. Yeah. Where? <laughs> um, you are the one that lived in Manhattan, I don't know. Um, okay, so in biology there is this notion of species, right? And species is, uh, the definition of a species isn't based on two things. One is the basic uh, unit of a biological classification, and the other one is that it's taxonomic rank. So biological classification is a very simple thing, simple thing, uh, a method used to group and categorize organisms into groups known as taxa. And when you group and categorize, you do this on the basis of some levels of similarity between organisms and what they do and what they eat and so on and so forth. And the second part here, oh, before we get there, because I'm still stuck in this space. Um, let's say we had groups of cars, bikes, and trains, and we had this other new organism that had come into the play. Uh, where would you classify it? Well, you could potentially classify it with the cars because of the engine that it was running. Um, and although you could also potentially classify it with a train because of the engine that it was running, we wouldn't know. Um, and then you could also potentially classify it with a bike because it looks more like a bike than it does a car, right? So this is a very subjective notion. What the organism does, what the organism looks like, and so on and so forth, is going to depend on whatever you are, who you are. Okay, um, the second part of that species definition is the taxonomic rank. And the taxonomic rank is the level or a relative position in the taxonomic hierarchy which subsumes under it a number of less general categories. Right, so the idea here is that if you belong to the life, if you are alive, you can be grouped into domains, kingdoms, phylums, class, order, so on and so forth to genus and species. And what, we do, <coughs> and what we do now is we name organisms according to the genus and species. And the reason why this is so um, precise, naming by genus and species, is that once you have named to a particular species, you cannot be in a different kingdom, right? So one species cannot be split into two different kingdoms. So it subsumes this way. So in terms of our vehicles, you know, we can, we can think of all vehicles out there as all transport, and then you can remove anything that doesn't move on land, and then you have large capacity transport, and then you have transporting people and transporting adults, okay? And you can see how this is a more and more defined capacity. So, so far so good, right? If we can agree on what are the important features of organisms that we need to be looking at for classification, then we could potentially say, okay, these are the classes. Everything that we see, every new entity that we see is going to be grouped into one of these classes. Is this clear? Okay. Now comes the difficult part. Um, this group is a lot more biology oriented, I'm told. Let's see. So speciation, which has the same root as the word species, right, is the evolutionary process by which new biological species arise. And this is a slightly different version of what we saw before. So let's say we had this bunch of organisms, that's a species containing a few organisms, and they happen to be living in a beach, on the beach somewhere, you know, that's nice and warm and sunny. And all of a sudden, I don't know, the humans come build a dam somewhere and, and the water level rises. And it just happens that half of this community is submerged in the water and half of it is not. So what happens is this evolutionary stress on the members of the community that are submerged. So what you can imagine is that this particular species actually splits evolution, by, via evolutionary purposes into two different communities which are diverse enough to be called species, okay? All right, now you have an issue. Because the original species was living on land and the new species is now living in the water, this particular species may look like another species, like members of another community which is not evolutionarily related. 
okay? So remember this story, the subsuming story? This species appeared over here, but it may actually look like, if you looked for physical descriptions, the original definition of the bedding of species, like that guy over there. Is that clear? Sure, think about it. Okay. All right, so then if we go back to our story about cars, we had some common ancestor over here, and this common ancestor gave rise to, let's say, this wheel and this boat, and that wheel gave rise to this wheel, and that produced a bike, and this wheel gave rise to this wheel, and that produced a car. That's the evolutionary concept, except that we don't actually know those connections, right? We don't know that that's how it happened. It could have been like this, it could have been like this, it could have been like this, and it actually could have been like this, although I really don't see that happening, okay? So it's, it's very difficult to say, and why is it difficult to say what happened is because we are actually not looking at all of this. What we are looking at is just this. So the vast majority of the organisms that ever lived have disappeared. They are no longer with us. So we cannot, even if we Try, if we had the algorithms for it to reconstruct the relationship between everybody, we do not have the evidence. We don't know who was there, okay? So now what we're stuck with is this, and we're trying to both reconstruct the history and meaningfully assign the groupings of these things. So how many of you think that it should be grouped this way? Yeah, what about this way? So the problem is that this grouping is exactly that. It's very subjective and it depends on what it is that you want to use this grouping for. Unfortunately, in biology, we only have one type of grouping, right? Okay, so that brings us to the next thing, uh, and that is the species problem. And you could guess that the species problem is really a bunch of really hard questions that arise from the somewhat conflicted definition of the word species and speciation. And you understand why it's conflicted, is that correct? Do, do, you, do you see my point? So there is the process of speciation, which is necessarily evolutionarily based, versus the bins of species that we would like to assign to these organisms. Is that clear? Okay. So the reason for this confusion is this notion of the tree of life. How many of you have heard of the tree of life? All right, everyone has heard of the tree of life. Who knows what it is now that they've heard of it? What is the tree of life? What's your name? Max. Max. Well, it groups all living organisms in some taxa, whatever, in some... Well, what, what does that have to do with tree of life? What is the point of a tree? Well, um, it groups them how they originated from one common ancestor. So basically, it did, tells you the evolutionary history. Is yeah. that what you're trying to say? Yeah. Right. So what we're saying with this tree of life is that Tree of life, the evolutionary history, is equal to the taxonomy of life, the grouping that we now preserve for these organisms. And this is actually very true for this phylum of, uh, for this um, kingdom of eukaryota, right? Because once uh, it makes the once you make the assumption that once two organisms speciate, they no longer interact on a genetic level. For eukaryota, that is very true. So you could have a fungus and a plant that have diverged in the tree, and you will never have a fun plant, okay? So the fun plant doesn't exist, too bad, although there are some plants that could classify as fun. Um, okay, this is where the state of the art is. Maybe at some point in life we figure out that there is in fact a fun plant and we didn't know about it, but okay. This is not true for bacteria, okay? Bacteria are actually a lot more likely to interact on a genetic level, even after speciation. So you can take a green filamentous bacteria and a proteobacteria and potentially ask, is there a green proteobacteria? And the reason why, the reason why you can actually ask that for bacteria versus the eukaryotes is the answer to everything is sex, okay? So the idea is that eukaryotes have sex and they produce offspring 
which are very specific to this reproduction of two organisms. Now, if you belong to different species, you can't reproduce, or you can't produce a fertile offspring, right? You can reproduce, like mules, for instance, but you can't produce a fertile offspring. Okay, and that means that you are confined to your own species and whatever trait you acquire is the trait that you pass down. So you, in eukaryotes that works really well. Um, in prokaryotes and bacteria specifically there is this notion of horizontal gene transfer. And horizontal gene transfer means that you as a cell can interact with another cell whether it's of the same species or not on the genetic level. Okay, so you can give your DNA, usually, you know, when you die, <laughs> someone comes and eats your remains and you can give your DNA. Um, you can do it via some outside vectors in, in transduction and you could also do bacterial conjugation and transfer plasmids which could become parts of bacterial genomes. So, for prokaryotes, the tree of life is really not a tree of life, it's more like what some people would call a bush of life, okay? So basically there is this mixing across lineages which does not exist once you get to the eukaryotic world, okay? So why is this important? Well, one of the reasons is because we make it important. So nature doesn't classify organisms. It doesn't care that this organism is A and this organism is B or whatever. It just says, oh, this looks like a good idea for this environment. Let's create an organism, okay? We do. We classify organisms. We assign names to them. And how do we do this? And I've said this before, we assign names on the basis of the distances between organisms. Okay, so Depending on how I define this distance, I would assign these two organisms to one group versus these two organisms to this, uh, this one organism to a separate group. So up until very recently, so again, we're in the world of bacteria, right? We're no longer talking about eukaryotes. So up until very recently, the gold standard in assigning two bacteria to the same species was uh, DNA-DNA hybridization rate. Uh, any of you do this, or have done this, or seen this before? Microarrays? No, DNA-DNA hybridization rate. Okay. Well, just in microarrays on a chip, you mean? Uh-huh. Cool. Um, I did not make that link, actually. <laughs> but yeah, that's the experimental link. No, so the idea is that you started with two bacterial organisms, two genomes, and it's never two cells, right? It's always a colony of these bacteria versus a colony of these bacteria. And you would label in some way, their, uh, uh, radioactive labeling would be one way, um, color labeling another way. So the idea would be to uh, label one set of bacteria one way, label another set of bacteria another way, denature the DNA of these bacteria and allow it to recombine, okay? So then the question is, if the genomes are very similar, what you're going to see is a lot of um, recombination of reassociation, sorry, this is the right word, reassociation of the genomes uh, from different colonies. Is that clear? So, if two genomes are identical, you should have very frequent reassociation. If genome, two genomes are very distant, you should have no reassociation. Is that clear? Yes? So we take one strand from one and another strand from another. Yeah? Okay. All right. So there was this cutoff of 70% that was established as the gold standard for naming two organisms as belonging to the same species. Okay? Now the problem with DNA-DNA hybridization is that it's too expensive and too time consuming. So we were looking for markers for ways of doing this in a cheaper fashion. So in the 70s, uh, this guy named Carl Verzi had come up with this marker gene, the 16S RNA gene. What is the 16S RNA? I haven't heard from you. 16S RNA gene? You guys are biologists, right? Yeah, no. Biologists. No? 
Yeah. So that's her RNA. It's on the slide. <laughs> no? Anybody? Do you know? I'm not sure if I get the question right, but it's part of the ribosome. Right, okay. So, great. It's part of a ribosome. What's her name? Maria. 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 Okay, so 16S RNA is the only RNA component of the small subunit of the ribosome, okay? So there are 21 proteins, there's one RNA. This is a interesting gene. Um, do you know of any cells that don't use ribosomes? Do you know of any cells that don't use ribosomes? No, right? No, I'm trying to get an answer here. This should be very clear. Everybody uses ribosomes, yes? Okay. Um, and every single prokaryotic ribosome has 16S RNA. So this is a gene that is present in every single bacterial organism. Okay. It's also about 1,500 base pairs long, the 16S RNA. And it has a lot of conserved regions, which are necessary for the maintenance of the activity of 16S RNA and therefore of the ribosome, okay? Between those conserved regions are the variable regions, regions which are not necessary for the functionality of the uh, ribosome in, in a very particular manner, right? So this is, they are somehow necessary. They're just not very necessary, okay? All right. So what Carl Vesey had proposed is that if you assume that these variable regions are truly variable and they're not constrained by anything, then they could be used as markers of how much time has passed since the separation of the two organisms. So they are subject to neutral drift, to mutation, and the number of mutations deferring two 16S RNAs is going to tell you how much time has passed between the separation of the organisms. Is that clear? Is there any issue at all with this? Sorry. <laughs> is there any issue at all with this? Or is everyone okay with that? You should not be okay with that. What would be, what's your name? Alex. Alex. Uh, I don't know, it's not linear. You can say so much mutations happen in so much time, so it's different every time. Because of? Why is it different? <laughs> I don't know. Perhaps some organism is. Um, um, is, is that also that? Exposed. Exposed to more ra radiation than another. Right, so there we go. So there probably is difference in rates, right? But what you can make an assumption about is that if you take these 16S RNAs globally, the differences between communities should indicate the levels of time that has passed, okay? More or less approximate, okay. Great, so now we have to figure out how the 16S RNA sequence similarity actually relates to our gold standard of assigning organisms. So we take this plot, the x-axis is the DNA-DNA hybridization, right? So this is where I said 70% is the cutoff. We have this 50 to 70 more or less border, the green line, okay? And each dot on the plot represents a pair of organisms for which it was experimentally determined what is the DNA-DNA hybridization rate and what is the sequence identity of the 16S RNA variable regions, okay? Okay, so we see that everything that is to the left of the, the green boundary, right, should be of different species. Can we figure out what the cutoff is in 16S RNA, which corresponds to the differences in species? Do you know? Not really. No, why not? Well, it's a question of how conservative you want this cutoff. You will never get the 100% correlation between DNA hybridization and 
the sequence identity, I think. Well, you have to stop thinking in binary terms. Listen to my question. I'm asking, is there a 16S RNA cutoff which will tell you that two species are different? Two organisms are of a different species? Yeah. Yes, which, what is that? What, well, you know? Uh, right. So you can say, in fact, two organisms are of a different species. Yeah? yeah? Okay. However, if you go above, the 97% cutoff, which is what we're looking at, you have both the same species and different species. Okay? So that cutoff can be used as a lower bound estimate for the diversity of the organisms, right? So this is at least that many different species. But it could be more than that. Yes? Everyone's clear on that? Okay. So 16S RNA was this single-handedly, I would say, was this one paper was established into the realm of biologists as the way to figure out what is a particular organism, right? Now, this is very important. We can't say that it is this organism, was this metric, right? We can only say that it's not this organism, okay? All right. So what people did uh, is they went out and they started sequencing 16S RNA and depositing them into databases. And there are currently three that I am aware of major databases of 16S RNA. And you can always ask the question, how do those databases look like in comparison to each other, right? How would you do this? Well, one way of doing it that our collaborator had done was take a gram of soil and pull out all the 16S RNAs that were there to ask what are the bugs, uh, what are the microbes that are there, okay? And it uh, should be a fairly simple question, right? You either find a match in the database or you don't find a match in the database and you can estimate certain things. So. This is a comparison of two of these three databases working on the same sample, the same gram of soil, and these are the differences in the different taxa of bacteria that were identified. Okay? So it doesn't look like this is actually being very meaningful in terms of identifying who is there. Okay? Now we can do this for another database comparing uh, another two databases, also no meaning, and comparing another two, so the, the, the remaining two basically, and also no meaning. So if you were to take a gram of soil and ask who is there using different databases, you will get different answers, which is probably not true biologically, or maybe all of it is true, I don't know, maybe we should be taking everybody and saying, yeah, this is it. Okay. So what do you think is the reason for this, Max? Ivan? I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Sebastian. Sebastian, all right, awesome. Do you have an answer? I think the question is how was the data of the sequences uh, achieved between the three different databases? What was the method for the sequencing? Fair. Method of sequencing. Uh, method of sequencing. And something like that. Average. What's the error rate? Of oh, what's the error rate? Sequencing? Yeah, so sequencing, obviously, if you're looking at 97% sequence similarity, three residue difference is going to be a, a big effect, right? So sequencing, what else? If those two databases would be identical, mm -hmm. sequencing mistakes would not differ. If they were identical in which... The, intent, the content of two databases would be identical. Uh -huh. And sequencing mistakes would not give it a classification. The one that is mistaken would be classified. Ah, no, but, but it's batch effects, right? So the idea is that you do the sequencing versus me doing the sequencing on the same it's data. Also the same sequence submitted to both databases? No. Oh. 
the, so the collection differs. That was your original question, I think, the content. <laughs> yeah. So the content differs. Different people submit to different databases, right? So there's going to be a bias towards particular sequences. There's chimeric sequences there. Uh, certain organisms have more than 116S RNA, not organisms, but organism species, right? Will have more than 116S RNA. Actually, in fact, there is a species for which there are over 500 different 16S RNAs. I don't know what that says about the whole species of that collection of organism, but okay, do you understand? Yeah, okay. So in fact, we did this very early on. We asked this question, can we from 16S RNA similarity identify two organisms as belonging to the same species or not? Now, uh, we're using NCBI annotated taxonomy uh, and that is actually very much based on 16S RNA. So in fact, this should be a very good estimate. But what we see is that if you focus on, let's say, this green line over here, is that at this 97% sequence identity, we only get 50% species accuracy, which is basically in line with what I was showing you before. If you're above 97% sequence identity, you have both same and different species, right? And you only get 80% coverage, okay? So that basically means that there are some same species organisms that are below that value, or 20% of them are below that value, okay? And the reason I'm showing you this curve is because if you ever do anything with microbiology, what you will see is exactly that. People using 97% sequence identity in 16S RNA as a marker of the same species. You can't do that. It's the marker of different species if you're below that, right? But you're above that, that means nothing. Is that clear? Okay. So there is other markers and they are not better. Okay, so there is uh, other proteins that are used and they're not better than 16S RNA. So in the end what this looks like is really this particular cartoon. Um, we do, we are very interested in microbes Right? We really want to understand what's going on. We want to treat infections. We want to use microbes in oil spill cleanup, uh, cleanups. We want to produce energy using microbial uh, organisms. We want to use them. So we do a lot of work here. So we do a lot of experiments. We isolate, we culture, we purify, we study. We do a lot of really hard, really difficult experimental work. And then we build all of these wonderful algorithms for trying to, how, trying to design the antibiotics, trying to optimize these communities of microbes that interact with each other on the basis of what, what we think they should be doing, but we are not really looking at the reality of what they are doing. We're trying to classify these organisms on the basis of some outdated markers on the basis of evolutionary history which has really very little meaning for these microbes and so on and so forth. Okay? So this miracle is where we want to try to contribute a little to computational biology. All right, so um, you guys have probably seen this slide before, although I don't know anymore. Uh, this is basically illustrating the drop in sequencing costs. So we can now sequence a bacterial genome re really, really fast. In fact, I, I think the rate was one bacterial genome, new bacterial genome a day. Uh, that's being added to the databases. It's not one bacteria, by the way, again. It's, it's a colony of bacteria. So these are organisms that can be um, cultured. So I think we're going to see an even bigger problem once we perfect our single cell sequencing techniques and, and then this is, this is where we're really going to need to do this very carefully. Okay? So the idea is that we want to use the genome as the source of information about the uh, organisms, which is not different from what we've been doing up until now. But we want to go from the genome to the functions of this organism, to the functionome. Now, forgive me for using this term. I'm not supposed to use anything ohm, but uh, unfortunately I have nothing that comes to mind other than that. Okay, and actually I've, I've asked people, and they had Jonathan Eisen tweet this and still no, <laughs> no answer. Um, anyway, the idea is that we look at genome, to protein, to functional mapping. 
Now, obviously, just because you have something in your genome doesn't mean that you consistently use it. And it doesn't mean that the amount in which you produce that particular product, right, is going to be the same across all kinds of genes. You need one gene, one protein of one kind and five million proteins of another kind, right, for whatever function that you're performing. But for now, we're only going to focus on the genome. Let's leave the transcriptome for later, okay? Um, the idea is to go from the genome to the proteins that are produced to the functionome. And here it's actually okay because in bacteria, if you're, it's very expensive for bacteria to maintain genes that they're not using. So if they're not really producing anything, these genes will most likely be eliminated from the genome. Okay? All right. So if we look at these uh, proteins that we have, uh, annotated in bacterial genomes, we see that actually annotations of these proteins are not very good. So what you see here across the x-axis is uh, bacteria. So every like dot here, every line here, every column here would be a bacteria. And uh, what you see on the y-axis is the fraction of the proteins that are unknown in that bacterial genome. So there is one bug for whom we only do not know 7% of the protein functions. Any guesses? E. coli? Yeah. <laughs> and then there is another bug for which we don't know 83% of bacterial functions. Any guesses? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So what we find, actually, is that we're extremely biased in our annotating of functions, right? So this is the distribution of the fractions of the genome of, that are unannotated according to the habitat which the bacteria occupies. So if we look at the soil or at the marine environment or at freshwater environment, we know significantly less, statistically significantly less, than what we know about the human bacteria. Okay? Um, as in, we do not care about anything but ourselves, which needs to change. Okay, so can I assume that everybody here knows what the HSSP metric is? Yes? Okay. Um, great, so then we have the HSSP distance and what we can translate the HSSP distance into is whether protein A and protein B share the same function. Right, so I still think it's important to point out that uh, the distance, the actual value of the HSSP score above a particular threshold may not be as informative um, as you would think. So it, it carries meaning in terms of the reliability of the prediction. So how likely are you to be correct in assigning two proteins the same function? But I don't think it carries meaning in terms of assigning how much of the 100% of the function is shared by these two proteins. So it's not that two proteins that have an HSSP distance of 10 are more functionally similar than two proteins that have an HSSP distance of 5. Okay? They're more likely to be functionally similar, but they're not more functionally similar. Is that a clear distinction? Um, is that assumption based on data or, or why I am um, coming to the conclusion? Um, because I, well first of all because HSSP uh, curve was optimized on yes or no parameters. Mm -hmm. So it's either the same function or different function. And second of all because I have no idea how to judge what amount of protein functionality is shared. So a protein has a function how do you judge that 70% you know, of this function is shared with another protein? I believe we, 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 we do like the last time, we assume this is a statement. Yes. And there is this thought behind that. Yes. That's okay. Fine. Fair enough. Let's make an assumption that we can create a cutoff at which we believe, a threshold at which we believe that we should really discuss that because I really want to know. Um, we should, uh, so we create a cutoff at which we believe that two proteins share a function versus the one where we don't. Okay? Um, okay, so what that gives us is the ability to create a network of 4.2 million proteins where two 
Network nodes, which represent proteins, are connected by an edge that has no weight, an undirected edge, of whether this is, the score is above HSSP10 in this case versus not. Okay? Is that clear? All right, so now what we want to do, and perhaps I should have changed my spelling, but um, we want to do some mark of clustering. Uh, are you guys familiar with this algorithm or should I go through it? No, you should not. I should not go through it. Uh, we have a little bit more time now. You went, went faster. I went faster. <laughs> I was trying to dedicate some computational time. All right. Okay. Before you go into it, just, it's totally on the previous slide. Uh, I just want to observe the goal is to classify genomes, the left. What we're, Jana is now going to talk about something, throw all of that goal away for the time being, let's classify the proteins. So in her next step, she's not classifying genomes, okay? It's just sort of an immediate step. Sorry. That is correct. It's clear on this slide, but I had overlooked it. But. So again, the nodes here, the vertices are proteins. The edges is whether two proteins, two nodes, share more than the HSSP distance of 10. Okay? Again, the edge is not weighed. This is the idea. All right, so the purpose of a Markov clustering algorithm is to take a bunch of random walks within a network, right? And the idea is that the substructure, the network substructure, cluster substructure of a particular network is going to assure that longer walks, random walks that you take, keep you within cluster more often than let you go outside, right? So the idea is if you have a density of connections within a cluster that's higher than those across clusters. So if you were taking random walks, the chances of you hitting that connection between clusters are lower than taking a path within a cluster. Is that clear? Okay. So trivially, this is what it looks like. Uh, let's say you have a network, right? You have um, two nodes, A and B, right? And there is a path, a self-path to A and uh, a path to B. Now, very, this is a very trivial network and it doesn't apply to the network of proteins because a self-path is assumed, okay? Does, does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So, you would be looking at connections, but I didn't want to introduce more complexity with the third node in here. All right, so the idea is that you can build an adjacency matrix for the graph. So you can say A is connected to A and A is connected to B. Okay, so you can get from A to A and from A to B, and from B you can get to A, but you can't get to B. Is that clear? Okay. So then, what we want to do is create, uh, I guess, a stochastic matrix. Basically, um, we want probabilities here. So how likely are you to get from one node to another? And for that, you normalize the columns to produce transition probabilities. So if you're at A, you can get to A and you can get to B. So that's the one half on half. <coughs> and if you're at, uh, so you, in order to get to B, you can only get there from A. And that's a one and a zero, okay? So the columns should add up to one because this is the total number of the probabilities that you can take for one path. Yes? Okay. So now what we want to do is ask the question, what if I took two steps? What if I didn't take one step if I took two steps, right? And in order to compute the probabilities of where you end up, starting from any of these nodes, you need to square, uh, you need to multiply the matrices, okay? So you do that and you get to that probability matrix over there, okay? And the idea is that now that I'm, I'm an A, how have I gotten there? Well, I must have started at A with a three quarters probability. All right, I'm at B, how did I get there? Well, I must have started at A with one half probability and so on and so forth. Is that clear? So this step is the expansion step. 
What we're trying to do is we're trying to walk as far as we can. Right? We're walking out from where we are right now. Great. And then what we want to do is inflate the numbers that we got so that we can separate the communities as clearly as possible. And to inflate those numbers, we're going to square the elements of the matrix, this probabilistic elements, right? And we're going to renormalize them so that the values still add up to one in the column. Okay? And we do this until convergence, more or less, until this matrix no longer changes. And that will get you to the point of ones and zeros. And you should look at it in a way such that if, this, if I'm here at this row node, right, what are the possible column starts for this? How did I get here? Okay? And those how did I get here will be the ones that define the clusters that you're looking for. So in the, long, in, in the intuitive sense, what that means is that if you took a lot of really long, really random walks, right, the cluster will be defined by your probability of staying within a particular set of nodes. Clear? Okay. So you can go from that to this, to this, and to that in a series of steps. So what we do from this point on is called every single one of these clusters a function cluster. Because remember the edges initially for us were these functional similarity edges. Okay. So what we claim is that we can go from 1,374 genomes carrying 4.2 million proteins to 1.2 million functional clusters. Each one of these clusters contains some subset of these proteins. Okay? So what we can do is we can map 1,374 genomes to 1.2 million functions. Okay, so now what we wanted to see is how, function, how consistent are the functional annotations of sequences within these clusters. Now, clearly there is a bias. The way that we annotate functions of proteins right now in databases is by looking at sequence similarity. So there is probably going to be a bias, definitely going to be a bias in what we see in named functions. But it's still the only way for us to look at the consistency of these functional clusters. So what we had originally, just to sort of describe the data, 900,000 proteins of the 4.2 million that fall into unique categories. They don't have an HSSP link of more than 10 with anything. Okay, so they're unique in our definition. Uh, and actually they're fairly interestingly uh, distributed. A little bit less than a third of them are either known or hypothetical of these proteins, right? And then about, uh, well, slightly more than a third or more than a third is the unknowns, right? So it's actually something that's expected. If you were trying to transfer function by homology and you couldn't find any homology, you would see no annotation, right? So that's the idea. So we do see this representation. Uh, for the remaining 3.3 million proteins, what we see is that they cluster into 190,000 clusters which contain at least one um, known protein, 119,000 clusters which do not contain any of the known proteins but contain hypothetical proteins, right, so the predictions, and then there is 25,000 unknown, and this is actually a very interesting number because you actually have something that you can look at. So these two, these clusters of proteins exist in more than one organism but no one has yet looked at them. So experimentally, this is a very interesting question to ask. Okay, so what we wanted to see is for the things for which we have annotations, for these 190,000 clusters, how, how consistent are the annotations? And in fact, we found that for 72% of these, or 71.4% of these clusters, uh, 90 to 100 of the annotated proteins actually share annotations. Right, so, and we didn't do lots of natural language processing, so share annotation means exactly share annotation as opposed to anything else. So probably these things are also fairly close. So 
we account for roughly 93% of all clusters that where, where basically proteins are annotated in a similar fashion. So again, this could be an algorithm bias because of the sequence identity, sequence similarity that we're using. But this is, again, one, only one of the ways that we, the only one of the ways that we can do on a large scale evaluation of how consistent are functional clusters. What is consistency? Do you, do you guys understand what consistency of functional clusters means? How you have clusters that have temporal units and how many of them are really the same function? Yes, so many of them. So is, this is clear, yes? So of the 10 proteins, how many of them actually do the same thing? In different organisms, right? Or, okay. So then, again, as I said, we can map these 1,374 genomes to 4.2 million proteins, which are actually 1.2 million functions. And then we can ask, in organism A, how many functions do we have? Now, organism A, could have two proteins performing the same function. Okay, so there will always be fewer functions than proteins, or at least either the same number or fewer functions than proteins. And then you compare this organism A to organism B on the basis of the total number of functions in each organism, and you see it's not symmetric because the number of functions is different. And what we do is we take the lowest number and part of the reason for this is that we expect that organisms that are truly similar are going to be of about the same functional size, right? So you're not going to have very many extra functions if you're not similar to another one. Okay? Okay, so we can build another network. So now this is a different network. This is not a network of proteins. Here, nodes represent organisms and edges represent the similarity value that I had just shown you, right? The lower similarity value. So, you can have two organisms that are 90% similar, two organisms that are 40% similar, and two organisms that are 30% similar on the basis of the number of the functions that they share as compared to the total number of functions in their genomes. Clear? Okay. So if we had a threshold of 70%, right, what we would have is two clusters, like that. Now if we had a threshold of 35%, we would only eliminate one edge, keep the other cluster, the whole thing. So what do you expect from clustering these 1300 organisms? How are they going to cluster? Let's say we had a 10% cutoff. So you, all you need to be in the same cluster is 10% similarity. What do you expect? One cluster. One cluster. And this is pretty much what we got. We had one huge cluster with a few little ones. Um, these are interesting because they have very specific versions of the functions that everybody else has. Um, so that differentiates them. And they're also very small as compared to everybody else. Yes? One question. Um, here we only cover um, homologs and not analogs. Is it true? What's an analog? Uh, so the same function um, but with no association to sequence identity. So, so the these functions um, uh, derived independently and, and not... Convergent evolution, you mean? I don't know the term, but... <laughs> okay, so the idea is that you have birds and bats that fly and the function of flying is done differently. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you probably... So you obviously can't pick that up okay. here. Uh, I don't know, maybe not very obviously, but you can't pick it up here the way that we well, set it I think up. It's obvious because you only use sequence information. Yes, but I don't necessarily know. Um, we'd use Cybless to find remote homology. So if you're saying it's completely not homologous, it's definitely just arrived this way, and there is more than one way of doing the same function, 
Yeah. So you need different, you can do the same function using different amino acid sequences. Yeah. In that case, you wouldn't be able to pick it up. But those are two very strict conditions which would probably not be very common here. Yeah, true, but those cases wouldn't be covered. Right, okay. right. So what, what is a m very, at least, interesting, much more interesting question to me than those, because those, I believe, are a very small fraction, is the, if the question of orthology versus uh, paralogy. So the idea that in the same organism you have two proteins that do the same function is very strange to me. And actually, it's a, it's a topic of discussion lately among a lot of people. I don't know if you've been reading Lear Pachter and Manolis Kellis' blog. But the idea is that um, in bacteria, the assumption has always been that because it's so difficult to maintain a genome which is useless, why would you have a maintained genetic duplication which doesn't change function at all, right? In which case, uh, having two genes that perform the same function is highly unlikely. So it would have to be somehow slightly different function. What are the reasons that it's very costly to... Uh... Resources. A bacteria is a single cell. Okay, right? just, if you have trash DNA, you don't need to replicate it. it That's not another discussion. Sorry? Let's not have this okay. replication. She did. I, I want to just know he, she, you did not answer the question. I want to I did. No. No, I, we would not pick up analogous uh, proteins. There's a long discussion. Okay. I, I, I bet you you have not answered that question. I have data for that. Okay. Um, all right. Let's let's have that discussion at some point. Um, great. So. I'm afraid to make any like sweeping statements in biology because they're always not true, right? It's great, huh? Yeah, it's yeah, horrible. Um, yeah. Okay, so I also find that my paper citation goes from in preparation to submitted in different <laughs> slides. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so where was I? The, this is a single cluster, obviously, right? Uh, well, maybe not obviously if you can't see that yellow line. But the idea is that these two organisms share more than 10% sequence um, function similarity. And these two organisms do not. But because of single linkage through other nodes, you get a single cluster. Um, now, what we did here is a force directed layout, just a simple layout, right? Uh, that it uses the weight of the nodes at the end of the edge and the connectivity of the nodes over here to separate out clusters, right? So subclusters of the network. We colored the nodes according to the current taxonomic classification and what we see is that there is actually grouping across clusters. Um, so basically what we're saying is that our functional annotation is consistent with taxonomic assignment, uh, at least on a higher level, right? So this is phylum and, and class level. And part of it, I mean, this is not surprising because a large fraction of functions in bacteria actually comes down from the vertical, from the evolutionary perspective, yeah? From the in, uh, ancestors. Is that clear? So the correlation of taxonomy, if you assume that taxonomy is evolution-based, and the functional similarity is actually expected. It's not expected to be tremendously huge, in my head at least, but it's expected to be there. Okay, so then if we took different thresholds, we can create different networks. Obviously, as you go up, the networks separate. And what you see is that every single cluster is a lot more consistent in terms of color but they are also splitting the colors up. So let's say this and this is no longer together. So the idea is actually very clear in terms of uh, the taxonomic classification as well. If you recall that there is levels. So these uh, clusters are probably more consistent across the lower levels of taxonomy. Very dumb question. If you, if you went further to 80% or something like that, would they come together again? No. No. Or the split ones will never come together? No. And this is the problem in my manuscript. <laughs> This is the one that I need to readdress. Okay, 
Um, so if you actually looked at the correlation of 16S RNA um, and the proteome and the functional metrics across the accuracy and the coverage of uh, pairs of species, right? So the 16S RNA you saw before is the blue line over here, right? And then you ask, okay, if I only use sequence identity rather than function clusters, how well would I do? And if you use the function clusters, you see that the green line is actually better, right? So we do somewhat better at predicting the current taxonomy, which is an oxymoron, guys, uh, because the taxonomy is based on 16S RNA. So how can we do better than 16S RNA? So the idea is that taxonomy is not just 16S RNA, it's a lot of research scientists actually looking at your organisms, looking at 16S RNA and looking at morphology and physiology. Now I argue that morphology and physiology are the manifestation of the metabolic activities of these organisms which are encoded in the proteome. Is that clear? Yes? Okay. So. What I wanted to do, because I stand on my uh, principle of disliking thresholds, even though I implement everywhere thresholds, is to try to avoid at least thresholding on the level of organism similarity. The reason for this is simple. Taxonomy is meaningless to me. Okay? I mean, it's a, again a wide statement, but it's, it's not useful. Naming things for the, same of, for the sake of naming them is not useful to me. What I want to know is how can I treat this infection? How can I use the uh, bacterial functions to do cleanup? How can I use the bacteria to produce energy? Those are metabolic functions. They're not, not taxonomic matters, right? So they correlate, but they're not the same. Right? So the question that I asked is whether we can look at the functional similarity of organisms and try to figure out a better classification scheme, right? or a more useful, not necessarily better, a complementary, more useful classification scheme. So what you see here is an all-to-all -all connected network, no cutoffs, right? but now the edges have weight, the similarity weight. And uh, the color scheme right now is still the, the taxonomy, but let's, let's go a little further. What we use is Louvain weighted clustering for this. And the idea of Louvain is to basically make sure that the total weights within a particular cluster are actually higher than the weights outside. Right? So there is more connectivity, more denser connectivity within the cluster than outside. And uh, this idea is uh, focused around optimizing this function of modularity. Okay, so modularity is described by this Q, right, um, where you want to look at all nodes I and J using their weight of edges uh, versus the edges outside of I and J. And you only want to look at these uh, communities to which I and J belong to if I and J belong to the same community. So basically what you're doing is computing modularity over these communities that you've created, over the communities which you've created, and you're summing it up over the entire network. Okay? So the way to do this is to initialize the uh, communities to single nodes in the network. You start with that, you give every organism a single community. And then you uh, detect really tiny, small communities by moving each of the nodes into each of the communities of its neighbors. Okay? And then you compute the difference in the modularity using this formula, uh, which is again some combination of the weights across in community and out community connections. And uh, once you've no longer, once you've reached the level of no more optimization, no more change in delta Q, positive change in delta Q, you stop and you say everybody that belongs to a single community is now combined into a node, right? And then you process the network again, okay? So uh, in some intuitive sense, 
<laughs> this is what it means. You have your nodes, your organism nodes that are connected. They are colored differently according to the community. And you start saying, okay, what if I moved this node into this community, right? So the star indicates the community that I kept. And I compute the delta Q. And uh, what if I move this node into that community? And what if I move those two nodes together? And actually, if you compute it, and it, I couldn't make it so it looks good, <laughs> but if you compute it, what you come out with is that actually works. Surprise, surprise, you have a higher edge weight on this. And what you get is a new node, which consists of those two nodes which now has a self-loop of 10 and a connection to the outside of 3, which is the sum of the previous connections of the two nodes internal to this node. Okay? Okay. So, uh, actually, as you do this, uh, if you saw my formula prior, it was basically a weight of moving a node into the community. You also have to commu compute the weight of moving that node out of its previous community and actually subtract that. Right? So... Okay, so uh, Louvain weight cl weighted clustering basically takes a network of connections and groups, uh, so labels the node according to the clusters at which there is no more optimization of modularity possible, and it aggregates these nodes into um, communities like this, and then you can go again. The problem, of course, is that if you let it run a long enough time, it will combine everything, okay? Okay, so this parameter here, you know, this optimal parameter which allows how, how long do you let it run, is called the resolution. And what we did is we asked, how does the resolution relate to the taxonomy of the organisms, the current taxonomy of the organisms? So for every pair of our 1,372 organisms, we computed the Jacquard index of mapping these two organisms to the same module at whatever cutoff using the taxonomic identifications of phylum, class, order, family, genus, and so on. So, okay. Um, the reason we do this is because we say, okay, these guys that have been doing taxonomic identification for years, they probably know what they're doing, right? To a certain extent. So we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they're correct. In, in the very many cases, and we're going to pick the modules that best correlate to their assignment. Okay? And we see that for the phylum level, right, here, the best, best correlation for us is just over Jacquard index of 0 0.4, which is not much. It's good, but not much. Okay? Uh, and I was actually very happy to see order, which is this middle thing here, um, be slightly higher than 0.6% because I think that's the one that's meaningful in terms of functions, of assignment of functions. So what we did is uh, pick those peaks for modules and we saw that, you know, at this peak for species we had 551 modules and 875 species and, you know, we believe that functionally there in fact is 800, uh, sorry, 551 separate sets of organisms rather than 875 species. And if you actually look at these classifications, you see a really large bias. So for instance, for some species, you have 99% sequence identity of the, um, sorry, 99% uh, genome identity for the genes that they carry and they will be assigned to different species. And for some of these organisms, they'll have 40% uh, genome identity and be the same to the same species. And it's a little difficult for people to understand, but the reality is that in the first case, these are pathogenic versus non-pathogenic organisms, where you want to say, okay, having this one pathogenicity gene makes you very different. And in the other case, uh, you know, soil, who cares? Okay? Uh, where, here? E. coli are E. coli. E. coli are good. <laughs> so they are all together. Huh? They are all together in one module. Uh, they. Uh, it depends on the resolution. They share seventy-five percent of their core functionality. Sixty-six percent. Sorry, a third of the. So. I can show you E. coli, we did some analysis and I can show you some cool it's stuff. It's not enough to know that they would fall into the same module, right? Um, so, at the... Could I from that immediately 
guess that they would. You can approximate. So the higher it is, the more likely. Yeah. So they they kind of do fall into a very close space over here. I don't know if they're at the peak altogether, but that's actually a good question to ask specifically. So. Basically, what that means is that if I took this class level modules, there are nine of them at class level, what you see is that some modules will have the gamma protea bacteria, for instance, explicitly, right? Just, just that, nothing else. But then you have gamma protea bacteria in this module and this module, right? And some classes will have that complete mix, and some classes will have the entire um, phylum, so this is cyanobacteria. Right? But they would also have something else. So it is mixed bag, right? Here. There is correlation, but there isn't very, very much correlation. It's not exact. So the, the way that we looked at this correlation, it was in trees, and we found that uh, the topological correlation between the taxonomy and the modules that we were producing was about uh, 0 0.56. So decent. Okay. So what that means is that I can take this distribution of organisms and I can recolor them and I could have my nine modules here and whatever I had over there and to me, just from the outside, this looks a more consistent and of course my numbers sort of confirm that. Yeah, what is left and right? Sorry? What is left and right? So this is the modules coloring. This is the same graph, colored by module versus colored by the current taxonomy. So you can, you can argue the statement that these guys are probably not the same as these ones, although they do group together here in, in terms of color. But uh, it, there is a really no consistent way of checking what, which one is more meaningful than the other. So what does that mean, really? How much time do we have? Three minutes, okay. So really that means very um, much more on the level of this this network, so smaller network, when you want to study things that are very specific. What we did is we took a part of here, this is cyanobacteria, all the cyanobacteria in our set. Cyanobacteria are cool because they're the energy producers that are photosynthesizing bacteria. We want to use them. Um, and what we wanted to ask is what is the difference between these cyanobacteria that we have in our set? We had no colors in these. Right? So cyanobacteria just grouped into these two groups that, uh, this way on the basis of the functions that they shared. Now it's a different representation. The edges have no weight, but each of these little gray dots over here is a function. And two organisms connect via a function. Okay? And the really cool part here is that if we did color these organisms, so we first group them, and then we ask, can we color them somehow? And what we found is that if we colored them by the habitat, we could see that these marine uh, cyanobacteria separate out from these freshwater cyanobacteria, with a couple of exceptions, granted. But what is most important is that these guys that are highlighted in the dashed blue line are of the same genus as these guys. So they're very similar to each other, evolutionarily speaking, right? So whatever the genes that are gained, the differences between them, are the ones that obviously account for this preference and habitat. So we could look at it in this way and ask, do we see a gene which would make sense in terms of accounting for the habitat? And in this case, we actually saw a huge difference in sigma factors, which is a stress response gene. So I think we found a salt factor here. And uh, another way to look at it is if we did this with mycoplasma, right? So mycoplasma here versus the pathogenic mycoplasma, and we can actually track epidemics in this way, evolution of pathogenic versus non-pathogenic organisms, hopefully. Don't know. Okay. I don't know why I have twice of this in any case. Um, so as a summary, fusion is independent, our network is independent of available annotations, 
it's basically possible to classify unannotated genomes and it allows for a mechanism for new species discovery. So you don't have to assign an organism to a module, you can leave it out, right? It can have a module of its own. Network-based clustering of organisms is more robust than using thresholds of pairwise similarity. So we're not saying, okay, two organisms have to be 50% identical. We're saying, okay, does it look like this particular cluster groups together? Functional comparison is informative of taxonomy. So we see a correlation with taxonomy, uh, but it also allows for a different classification type and classification means. And function-based classification seems to seamlessly incorporate the effects of the environment as we saw that the marine versus uh, freshwater and horizontal gene transfer. So we do a lot of cool things in the lab and I think we're not doing enough apparently after talking to Burkhardt. And um, I need some people to do things. So if you're interested, let me know. <laughs> That's not the case. Thanks again, Yana. Mm -hmm. uh, we will next Tuesday.